staying. <laughs> when you're the last on the agenda, it's kind of always challenging to think about whether people will stay, so thank you for staying. Um, some of you may know me. If you don't know me, I write lots of books. 22, current number, working on number 23 right now. And I blog every single day at thefinancer.com about banking, technology, finance, the future, fintech. That's my space. I'm going to very quickly summarize what I see as the past, present, and future of banking, technology, finance, and fintech. And I'm going to speak quite quickly because I've only got a short amount of time, so keep up. We've just had a recent past that's been very troubled with a pandemic. For two years, I was locked into my room near enough, like many of us, not sure whether I'd get back to a normal life, but we are back to a kind of normal life. Although I live in Poland and we have a lot of issues with our next door neighbors being at, in a debate crisis with Russia. For the two years I was watching my room, I was lucky to spend most of it with my two little boys who were four years old when the pandemic started. These are my boys, Eddie and Freddie. And so five of my books are children's books, Captain Cake and the Candy Crew, to sweetly go when no sweet has gone before. Those were written during the pandemic lockdown. The reason why I put my boys on screen is that when you have children, and these are my first and only children, it makes you question everything in what's going on in the world. It makes you think about things. My boys think I'm Iron Man, I guess because I grow my beard for them. I think I'm more like Doctor Strange, and Iron Man is obviously much more like Elon Musk. In fact, I'm far more like Bruce Banner, to be honest, than like uh, Tony Stark. But these questions came into my head around money, finance, technology. For example, our world does not exist the way we see our world. Our world has no countries. We just made them up. And the internet doesn't recognize countries. And that's a huge issue for regulators and for companies and for financial institutions. How do you deal with a world connected through the network of currencies that don't recognize countries' regulations and borders? Time does not exist. Albert Einstein made this point, and it made me sit up and think, wow, that's true. If you go to China, China has one time zone, and for such a big country, you would think it would have three. If you go from Afghanistan into China, you have to put your clock forward three hours. We just made time up. And now we talk about real time and doing everything transparently, interconnected globally, immediately, on demand. That changes the way we should think. We also have issues with thinking about money, because money does not exist. We just made it up. The dirham doesn't exist. It's just invented. The same with the euro and the, the dollar. In fact, right now, there's a big debate around de-dollarizing the world. Does the dollar stay as the reserve currency of the world? What happens if it isn't? What do we do? How does that change how we bank and how we think? In fact, it makes you realize that the whole way in which we grew up is not the way in which our children will grow up. It's not the way of the future. We have to think different. And what does thinking different really mean in finance, technology, banking, and fintech? It means looking at where we are today and recognizing that the way in which companies exist today and the way in which the world is moving today is moving in a very different way. FinTech for me, and I always come back to this point, is the marriage or the partnership of parents and children. Part of the reason why I put Eddie and Freddie on the screen. The parent wants stability, security, reliability, resilience to keep the status quo, to keep the world safe. The child wants to kick the walls, paint the windows, jump up and down and break everything and create a different future. And when you see this in reality, and I see this every, almost every day, because I walk into the boardrooms of banks and fintechs, I, I, you know, I, I, can, I can feel it. Because if I walk into the boardroom of a bank, I see a lot of people like this. Whereas if I walk into the boardroom of a fintech, I see people like this. 
changing the world with a different vision, a different idea. And I've thoroughly enjoyed the rise of fintech because we've seen billions of dollars invested in thousands of companies that are changing the world with a new vision, with vitality and youth. Putting it in context to me is I track the value of Stripe and the industry. And the industry has grown from almost nothing in 2010 to being 38% of the market value of the financial markets players by 2021, from 3 to 38% by value. Every single aspect of the market has been taken apart by these new visionary technology players. And typically, they're doing one thing brilliantly well. They're not trying to do everything. For example, Stripe, when they launched, just launched a payment checkout mechanism with seven lines of code. That was in 2011. By 2016, they were worth almost $10 billion. By 2018, they doubled in value. By 2021, they'd almost doubled in value again. Sorry, 2019. By 2021, they'd tripled in value. You know, in a decade, they'd gone from nothing with seven lines of code to become one of the major global payments players with just a few thousand people. You, know, you compare that with traditional financial institutions like Commerce Bank. And Stripe's worth nine Commerce Banks with a tenth of the people, or three Deutsche Banks with a fifth of the people. What's going on here is basically the traditional financial markets are structured around physicality and distribution through buildings with humans. But now we have digital finance built upon software and servers. The new world of digital is driven by data, not by buildings with humans. And this is the stark reality that is highlighted so well by Stripe. Having said that, Stripe's stumbled a bit like a lot of fintech. So the valuation went down to 63 billion in January and actually down to 50 billion by March because what we're seeing is what I call the fintech bloodbath. We're seeing so many companies losing value, so many having to lay off staff, so many imploding. The reason being funding has dried up. Klarna's lost about 85% of its value in the last year. Revolut's lost 60%. And as I just showed you, Stripe's lost a half. But this is not an implosion. It will continue. A little bit like saying the internet was dead in the year 2000 after the internet boom and bust. It wasn't dead. It got stronger. There was a headline page, front page on Time magazine in the year 2002 that said, Amazon's future looks like it's dead. Well, I think Amazon did pretty well in the last 20 years. So the surviving fintechs will grow stronger, but we are seeing a bloodbath right now. Nevertheless, there's still investment going into fintech, and there's still unicorns being created. 2058 in 2022, 312 today. So it's not doing that badly. It's just that if you're a young startup, it's been tough the last 12 months, 18 months, and it will stay tough for the next 12 months. Then we come to cryptocurrencies. And right now, my theme that I'm focused upon is cryptocurrencies and CBDC, central bank digital currencies. Can we decentralize finance, or does it need to be centralized, or does there need to be something in the middle? In my view, there needs to be, to be something in the middle, which I call hi-fi, hybrid finance, decentralized for transactions, centralized for governance. And it made me laugh the other day because there's an advert running in Britain, which, if it works, is quite funny. It doesn't look like it works. Oh, here we go. Now, what's your preferred digital currency for this exchange? Have a fiver? No. It's crypto only, mate. For potatoes? And onions. <laughs> what a load of malarkey. Yep. 
people don't actually transact with crypto. I mean, we can. Has anyone bought anything with Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency over the internet? I have. It wasn't that easy. It's quite a lot of malarkey, as they just said. But I just like the advert because it's like that idea of saying it's crypto only. You know, people don't transact that way. They might tomorrow. And there's lots of things developing that are going to encourage that. But today, a bit like the fintech bloodbath, there's a crypto winter. The value of most cryptocurrencies have gone down dramatically in the last year, 18 months. You know, Bitcoin is still bobbling around the $30,000 level, uh, whereas it was much higher a year ago. The same with Ethereum, Cardano, Polygon. What's interesting for me is the number of companies that went bankrupt during this period. In fact, that created the crypto winter, like Sam Bankman Freed with FTX or the implosion of Terra Luna that was meant to be a stable coin. And yet we have seen this many times in the past, such as Canada's best Bitcoin exchange, where the founder was the only person who had the password, and he died. And so the exchange imploded, or Mt. Gox, just over 10 years ago. Funnily enough, with all these things, what tends to happen, going back to this idea of decentralizing and centralizing and hybrid finance, is that when the implosions happen and money is lost, people ask, who can I call? How do I get my money back? And this has been the big issue for many of the people who've invested in cryptocurrencies or in fintechs to a large extent, to say, how do I get my money back if I've lost? Who's regulating this stuff? Bob Diamond, the former chief executive of Barclays Bank, recently came out and said, I can't think of anyone who believes that in the future a digital version of the dollar for corporates and institutions isn't going to happen. We are definitely going to digitalize money. The question is, is it a digital dollar or a digital dirham or a digital renminbi or a digital euro or a digital bitcoin or a digital ethereum? It's your choice. A digital basket of currencies, a digital basket of currencies run by the G20. We're going to see a big change in money, finance, and it's going to be encouraged even more by the metaverse. Why am I flickering? <laughs> in fact, if you go to those websites, Metaverse Bank, that is me, just to tell you. Like many people, I was excited by the metaverse, and then I've got less excited. Um, I think because it doesn't have legs. And Mark Zuckerberg has realized it doesn't have legs, um, literally and um, figuratively. Having spent $24 billion in two years on building Meta, Mark Zuckerberg came out the other day and said, I'm dropping this because we are going to invest in artificial intelligence. It's far more important. That seems like a lot of money to have spent on building a metaverse, and yet putting it in context, he stated that's 10% of our budget for R&D investments. It just shows how much money Facebook has. So the metaverse is going through a big change. And what I find interesting is that one day there probably will be a metaverse. I don't know what it will look like. Probably like the holodeck on Star Trek The Next Generation, where you open some doors and you walk into another world. And you physically feel that you've been transported into another world. And a lot of people have invested in trying to do things around the metaverse. So I have no idea why there's a tiger in JP Morgan's branch, but there you go. But I always come back to my experience of a other world virtual life of 15 years ago called Second Life, which is actually still running. The idea being, if you don't like your real life, get another life. And that experience was that, yeah, I played in Second Life. I enjoyed the experience. I did quite a lot of engagement and talking with people in another world, living a virtual life. And I got very interested myself because there was real money that was being made in Second Life, buying virtual properties and selling it on the main streets. But the thing that really intrigued me was the bank of Second Life, the biggest bank in Second Life that was Ginkgo Bank. And Ginkgo Bank allowed people to actually put real US dollars into a virtual bank. And then one day, it just disappeared. It turned out upon investigation that Ginkgo Bank was being run by 
a Sao Paulo student in Brazil who, having taken $1.5 million of real US money, just pressed delete and bought himself an apartment and a Ferrari. And for three months, the people in Second Life demonstrated outside the headquarters of the Second Life operator, Linden Labs, and said, give us our money back. And they said, it's not our job to regulate this, we're just a platform. And then they eventually said, after three months of demonstrations, okay, if you want to be a bank in a virtual world, you must be a bank in the real world. And the point I'm making here, whether it's cryptocurrencies or fintech or the metaverse or anything, is that you need governance to have finance work successfully. I don't know what governance you need, and this is a debate I'm having myself right now. Could it be the governance of the network of citizens on Earth through the internet? Or does it have to be a central bank or a central government authority? And this is where a lot of technologists, because they're very naive, including a lot of fintech people because they're young, get it wrong. Even Bill Gates got it wrong. Bill Gates said, we need banking, but we don't need banks. Complete rubbish. We need to make payments, but we don't need banks to make payments. We need to save and invest, but we don't necessarily need banks to save and invest. We need to borrow and get credit, but we don't need necessarily to go to banks to get credit. But the core thing that banks do, and this is where the naivety steps in, is that they are licensed and governed and provide a guarantee of trust that you will not lose your money. Nothing else does that. Which is why I think banks will be around for the next century or more maybe even the next millennia or more. Depends on whether in the future we actually have money, which is a debate around Star Trek. But if you store money, you need something that's trusted. If you're just transacting, it doesn't really matter. And I think decentralized finance for transacting is fine. But I don't trust storing my savings and investments on a platform that's decentralized if there's no guarantee or license, or backing. It's just the Wild West. And we've seen that pretty often. In the future, the main thing I'm going to finish with is obviously that we're going to be dealing with boards that look like this. It's going to be a very different world full of robotics and artificial intelligence. We'll, we'll actually need to have jobs. You know, will humans be employed? The whole thing about artificial intelligence is becoming very scary, but also very exciting. You know, it's both. I kind of think there's huge opportunity, but at the same time, as we've heard on this afternoon, you know, we could all replace each other with chat GPT. Elon Musk is saying that everything around AI is going to be where they're focusing investments and actually has now XAI to rival OpenAI. Google's doing the same, and as mentioned, Facebook's following suit. So obviously this is a thing. This is the thing to focus upon and try and work out what it means for ourselves. People think it might be very scary. Jeffrey Hinton, the head of AI, and actually the creator of a lot of ideas around deep learning and artificial intelligence, said that it's almost like we've got aliens landing and we haven't realized that they've landed because they speak very good English. Yeah. Um, where is all this going? AI, metaverse, cryptocurrencies, fintech, banking. I think it's going to a world where obviously everybody will work with machines. I'm hoping that my teachers of my children will teach my children to learn the things that machines cannot learn. Otherwise, what's the point? Obviously, children should be taught things around emotions and relationships and empathy, much more than math or history or geography. And when I look at the other areas around, yep, they're all very exciting, but everything is changing dramatically, rapidly. And our job is just to try and keep up with it all. And in particular, try and use what we do to make the world a better place. There's a big rebellion going on 
around the banks that are investing in fossil fuel firms, Barclays being one of the biggest culprits. HSBC has just come out the other day and said that they won't invest in new fossil fuel projects. Whether that's true or not, we'll find out. But what I see is interesting is uh, so many companies, particularly in the fintech space, are saying, how can we use technology and finance to make the world a better place? How can we do good for society and good for the planet? And I think that's a really interesting theme to finish on because that's positive. That's saying, how can we use AI, the metaverse, cryptocurrencies, fintech, technology and finance to do good for our children and make the future a better place for them? So I guess my final point is we need to focus upon how can we harness the power of technology to make the world a better place for ne the next generations. And in particular, that yeah, I am Iron Man. Thank you very much. Thank you.